Skaggers or front Don Eagle It's like only Trum 2 Well I'll get them the slip and then we'll take a sip of the rare old mountain dew I did a love my little I love my little So everybody knows that there is a doctoral training center webpage and it has the full program with all of the locations and times and dates of all the seminars and the topics and all that stuff. So if you can find my webpage and add DTC, you find all the information about all the locations, all the topics, you know, every, every community event. I think everybody's, at least that's the URL I sent in one of the emails or a few of the emails. So if anybody's confused about the times or locations or dates or anything, everything is available there. There is also actually a YouTube channel for this seminar. And if you when my internet connection is working, it stopped working because I upgraded my Macintosh operating system last night. So it's not working anymore. <laughs> if you click on this link, you can find the Doctoral Training Center YouTube channel with a playlist of all the seminars. So right now, all the seminars from last year are on there. So I do try to record the seminars and, and, and so on. And I don't know if I should try to fix my... Probably I should just not bother with the internet connection. And just do without it today. Okay, that's saving. Getting close. Okay, so let's look at today's topic. Oops. Yeah, this is a very old Mac, so it's a little bit slow. I have two Macintosh laptops. The other one completely stopped working when I upgraded the operating system. So at least one <laughs> works kind of. So some of the things still work on it. <laughs> I will exit on there. So today's topic is actually really exciting on close and distant reading of scientific research papers. Does anybody already know what those terms close and distant reading mean? Has anybody ever even heard those terms before? Nobody? Good. So today you're going to find out what those terms mean. They don't apply to just scientific research papers, but we're going to apply those concepts to scientific research papers and you're going to discover some new things. And this is really unique content. Like this seminar, you cannot find this seminar anywhere else in the world. You just cannot. Nobody else teaches this. Nobody in the physics department, nobody in geography, nobody in bioscience, chemistry. It doesn't matter where you are, geography. You cannot find this content there. So, as as PhD students, what is your mission? Your mission is to try to contribute new knowledge, right, to where the previously knowledge didn't exist. And, but in order to do that, you have to determine what problems have been solved in your area and what problems have not been solved, right? That's part of your mission. It's like if you want to finish your PhD, you first have to identify the unsolved problems but in order to identify unsolved problems, you need to identify the solved problems, right? And then derive information about the unsolved problems based on discovering what problems have been solved, right? 
solve problems. If you want to find solved problems, you look at research papers. Right? Research papers are problems that have been solved. That's one way to think of them. So that yeah, here we solve this problem, and now we've published this paper, and that's a solved problem. Now, you want to find unsolved problems, therefore you're looking at research papers that describe the solved problems, but the challenge is you have thousands of previously published research papers, right? maybe tens of thousands. Right? This is one of the big challenges with your PhD, is the massive volume of literature. Right? It's huge. And so, how do you deal with this complexity? How do you manage, how do you navigate through this crazy information space, this very large, dense information space of previously published literature? Which you need to do. You have, you have to go through that. Right? Every academic is always grappling with this challenge. Right? It, it never stops. Right? How do you navigate this information space of thousands of previously published research papers. That's really what the topic of today is about. Some strategy. One strategy, which is what a lot of people do, is they'll print out a paper, for example, and they'll read it from the first sentence to the end, last sentence, and then they'll put it on a stack. And then after a few years, the stack just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Has anybody ever seen an office with big stacks of research papers just covering everywhere? I definitely have. That's one way to approach it, and that's the way probably people approach the problem by default. Right? And, you've seen, and it's the most naive way of, of, of handling that. Can anybody see any problems with that approach? Yes, you forget what you read in the first place very, very good. Yes. So you might have read something a year ago and you forget. Any other? Like if, okay, let's say, imagine it this way. I give you, here's a thousand research papers, please read them. What would your answer be? What would your response be? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll be back like, tomorrow. <laughs> Any ideas? So it, it, that it's it's almost impossible. You you would you come back in a few years, you know, and you say, okay, I'm done now. Right. <laughs> in the meantime, a thousand more papers have been published. So we're really talking about a strategy to handle lots of previously published research. How do we navigate through this massive complexity? Right. That's what today's. So now we, we discussed a little bit about why we're, we're here, like what we're, what we're going to be talking about. We're going to introduce these concepts of distant versus close reading. There is some previously published related work on this topic. It's not exactly this topic, but to, go, to be academic, we can mention the previously published literature. Then we're going to describe this concept versus implementation. So this is a lot of a lot of interesting ideas to absorb today, right? And then we're going to look at extracting the essential essentials of a scientific research paper. What are the essential elements that you look for when you look at a scientific research paper? And we have examples from computer science, physics, mathematics, bioscience, and geography. And then we have just a little bit about breadth versus depth. Where is the attendance register? Can we pass that forward? Uh, I'd like to have a sense of which departments are here, and then um, we can look at those departments a little bit more closely. So one of the takeaways today is when you see a previously published paper, it's not necessary to try to understand or read all of the details in the paper. 
right? It's not necessary to understand every single thing that's previously published, all the details. Right? It's just not necessary, right? Especially when you are trying to get an overview of the literature, right? This is the phase you're in. You're all in this phase. Like, I want to get an overview of the previously published literature. So this is an approach, what we're covering today is an approach to identify what are the essential elements of inside of previously published research papers and how do I identify them and how do I extract those essential elements. And then you will put the pieces together and identify solved and unsolved problems in your area, right? The goal is a literature survey, right? By the end of your first year, you all want to have a high-quality literature survey. Right? That's very exciting. And you're all probably wondering how to go about that. That is something we do. We do have a, a special seminar just dedicated to literature surveys. This is the step before the literature survey. It's like, given a single paper, how do you process a single paper? The literature survey is then how do you fit all these previously published papers together into a literature survey. And a literature survey, why do we talk about literature surveys? Because they're a good way to figure out and see what are the solved problems in my area and what are the unsolved problems. And this is based on previous experience of writing survey papers writing and supervising. Well, I was a PhD student myself, right, and I supervised PhD students. Interest, this is just really a side note. It's not absolutely essential, but we're all academics here, so we always mention related work. There is some related work on this topic, right, and here's a paper that describes how to write a survey paper in health sciences. Right. The, what we're talking about here is a single research paper, really, navigating each single research paper, one after the other. There's, there, there are previously published papers that describe how to read a research paper when you're a reviewer. You guys are not at that stage yet, but someday you might be, and you might have a look at this. Right. The previously published literature usually talks about surveys, and there are some papers that talk about how to get a paper rejected from being published in the first place. There, there are no previously published research papers except for one that talks specifically about extracting the essentials of a single research paper. So let's introduce these terms, close versus distant reading. So close reading is what we're familiar with already. This is like the default reading process. You pick up a paper or a book or whatever it is, you start with page one, you read the first word, then the second word, then the third word, but all the words from the start to the beginning in linear order, right? Reading every word from start to finish, that's the traditional way of reading. It's called close reading. That's another term for traditional reading. Distant reading, on the other hand, is not reading every single word. So distant reading is seeing only a visual representation of a paper, like on a map or a graph or something like that. Yeah for large, representing usually large numbers of papers. This is, a, this is a hierarchical graph, and every glyph on this graph represents a single paper, a previously published paper. And they're connected, right? So this is a parent node, and these are the child nodes that were published after the parent that are derived from the parent. And here's the grandchildren. Here's a grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-grandchild. 
and the papers have different properties. So the shape corresponds to one property, the color corresponds to another property, the projector is not very good, the resolution, and neither is the display here. But the shape corresponds to one property of the paper, and the color, right? The position represents the child-parent relationship. Right? That's, that's another way of, of, that's an example of distant reading. So you don't even see the papers. You only see a symbol of what's contained in the papers and how they're related to their predecessors right, or successors. Right? You can gather the, the properties of the paper in, in a, in, in a legend like this. That's distant reading. So you, you, you see everything from a distance, so to speak. You don't see the details of anything up close. What we're going to talk about today is, n is neither really close reading or distant reading. It's somewhere in between. It's, it's neither one. So we're, we're going to be reading subsets of papers, essentially. <clears throat> and what does in between look like? This is an example of in between. This, these are two documents. This is something that compares two documents with each other. This is one document, actually, a distant, a distant representation of one document because you can't see what's written there. The user clicks on one of the rectangles and they see the original text inside the document. And they can do, here's the second document, and the corresponding text is highlighted and the corresponding text is shown. So that's somewhere in between, it's close and distant reading. We're going to talk about something that's a little bit like this today. There are no software tools involved, by the way. This is just a software tool that's meant to facilitate comparison of documents, right? It's just an example. We're not going to use any special software tools. Everybody happy with the concepts of close and distant reading? I know what you're all thinking right now, or some of you are thinking, Oh, I don't see how this is relevant. <laughs> this is, it's suspense, though. I'm, I'm, I'm providing you with suspense. You're going to see the relevance, right? But I want to trigger some sort of suspense before we get to the punchline. Before we move on, though, we have to separate this, these ideas of concept and implementation probably you've never had a discussion about this topic. I, I still remember the first time my master's thesis supervisor clarified this to me, and I am still very thankful for that. And now I'm passing on the, the gift. So what we, need to, we need to understand what a concept is and what an implementation is, and that they're not the same, they are different. So if we look up the word concept in the dictionary, it says a general notion or idea, a conception. <laughs> That's not a very helpful definition, but an idea of something formed by mentally combining all its characteristics or particulars, a construct, a directly conceived or intuited object of thought. That's from dictionary.com. Maybe if I turn down the lights, it might Does that help at all? That's the concept. This is implementation. The act of accomplishing some aim or executing some order. Or the act of impl implementing, providing a practical means for accomplishing something. Carrying into effect. This is all from dictionary.com. These are very abstract definitions, but it's just good to see, okay, what does the dictionary actually have to say about these, these terms? We're going to go into this in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> so this is, these are my words, so to speak, that try to clarify this a little bit further. A concept is an idea or a thought. 
for purposes of this seminar. A concept is abstract. It's not something tangible. It doesn't have mass. You can't put it on a scale. Yeah, it put it, it, if we talk about things in terms of science, right, it's not tangible. It's just an idea. Right? It's, it's something in your imagination. Right? An implementation is an actualization or realization of a concept. So it's taking an idea and bringing it into reality. So in implementation, it's, it's a concept that's been brought into reality, into the physical world, and we can usually put it on a mass and weigh it, uh, on a scale and weigh it. Right? Um, a, a, a concept usually starts out as an idea in someone's mind, right? And then usually what happens is a concept is written down on a piece of paper. Maybe it's even written down as a hypothesis or a specification, and then a concept is implemented. So we have an idea, and then we want to actually implement the idea. So an example could just be a motor vehicle, like that's a concept, the concept of a motor vehicle. Does anybody in here know what a motor vehicle is? How would you, what is a motor vehicle? Or what would you say it is? Anybody? Shall I call on somebody? I think everybody here is familiar with motor vehicles. How about Sam Holmes? Car. A car, right. How would you, if you were trying to describe it to somebody that never saw one before, what would you say? What is a car, motor vehicle? Um, something that can move that is powered by an engine. Mm -hmm. Does it have a purpose? Get you from A to B. Exactly. You could say it's some sort of motorized vehicle or a motorized uh, a method of transport to get from one point to the other. That's a, that's a motor vehicle. Right? And it runs on some fuel by right? using a motor. That's the concept. You can think of it, you can imagine it, you can write it down on a piece of paper, and that's what somebody did, right? Before the car, somebody made a car, they thought of it first, didn't they? They thought of it and then they made it. Making a car, when you've made one, does anybody know what that's called? What's the next step after we've thought of the car and we actually want to make it? We've instantiated a car object. What's that called? <laughs> That's the implementation of the car. Does that make sense? So you have a concept and then you have an implementation, which is bringing the car from the imagination into reality. That's implementing the mode. It's an implementation of a motor vehicle. Does that make sense? Can everybody see the difference between those two things? <laughs> good, good. Here's another example. I don't know why I think of this example, but I just do, and there it is. A writing utensil. It's a concept. What's a writing utensil? A tool that can be used to communicate with others using symbols drawn by a person or an animal. Right, that's a writing utensil. That's a concept. What's an implementation of a writing utensil? A pencil. Right, that's taking that idea and actually constructing something in reality. Right, the pencil is a type of writing utensil, or more specifically, it is the implementation of a writing utensil. I mean, one concrete pencil is an implementation, but a pencil itself is again a sub -concept. Yes, that's right, that's right. So you can, you can identify a pencil and you can move it up to the concept. 
you can, it is another concept, but you also have some implementation, and it's that object. Yes. It's that object you pick up and, and you draw with. That's an implementation. So you can see that th there's a difference between concept and implementation. There are some concepts that don't have implementations, right? That, it's nice to be able to think of those, like concepts that don't have implementations. Right? We, with a pencil, graphite is used to write down on a piece of paper. That's like somebody's taken the idea of writing a pencil and then said, okay, here's one way we can achieve this. This is the implementation. The other thing that's interesting to notice is there are an infinite number of implementations for this concept. So it's not like one-to-one -one mapping, it's one to infinite, one to infinity. So you can, you can have an infinite variety of pencils and writing utensils, right? If we, pick, if we collect pencils, chances are two of them are not gonna be the same. We just go around and collect them. Same with pens. Pens are different than pencils. Markers, we can write with blood. Whiteboard markers, chalkboard markers, spray paint. Like, there are an infinite number of implementations for the writing utensil concept. Everybody see that? So everybody think they can see the difference between concept and implementation? <clears throat> so there are just some more thoughts on this. There are many different implementations of a concept, right? Palm pilots, <laughs> that's a good implementation as a writing utensil, right? Does everybody know what a Palm Pilot is? That's an already, like, technology that's come and gone. It's, it's gone already. It used to be very popular, Palm Pilots. You have an unlimited variety of different implementations for a writing utensil, right? For a given concept, there may be many different implementations. Now, this is important to to distinguish when you're reading a research paper. You want, when you're picking up a scientific research paper, you want to make the distinction between concept and implementation. And guess which one you, is, the, is the focus, is the more important part? Anybody want to guess? Which one's more important? Hey, Liv, any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway. Anyway. Guess which one is more important in our, in our lecture when you're reading previous papers, the concept or the implementation? They have their own importance, but I think the difficult thing is finding the concept because there are many options to implement this concept. That's correct. For the purposes of this seminar and your PhD, the concept is more important than the implementation. So what new people do, like beginner love, beginning research students, is they focus on the implementation and they don't think about the concept. So in your literature search, you don't want to get lost in the implementation because it's not important right now. For your literature search, you want to focus on solved and unsolved problems, and that's at the conceptual level. Right? You, want to, you want to get the concepts of each research paper. So uh, about the concepts. So the concept in the, in the, in the, in the world of scientific research papers is what the authors are trying to achieve. This is the concept of their research paper. So when you pick up a research paper, you're trying to extract the concept. What, is, what are the authors trying to achieve? What is the goal of the work that they're presenting? And what is 
the contribution of the paper, what's new. This is the concept, and this is exactly what you want to extract from all scientific research papers that you pick up. You want to extract the concept. You can also think of that as what. What is being done, and why is it being done? That's another way to think of it. And the implementation is the how it's being done. That's not so important. So a lot of newbies, for lack of a better term, they get obsessed in the how things are done. And you get lost, very lost. Right? Because the how is very complicated. Right? So it's a team of people that work for a few years on some project. Right? And that's not important though. If you're trying to identify solved and unsolved problems, the how is not important. It's the what and why that's important. It's the concept. Right? Implementation. How is the concept realized? How do the authors support their hypothesis? How do they implement the concept? This is the part you leave out. So these are the essentials of the research paper. Well, let's say we don't completely leave it out, but we don't focus on it. You notice most of the research paper is occupied by this, by this property. You know, most of research papers is taken up by implementation, how things are accomplished, because you're supposed to be able to reproduce the work. Right? That's why most of it is about how. So we take that and we don't focus it on it. We don't focus it, focus on it anymore. The other essential thing is related work. What previous work does this paper build on? Usually there are one or two very important previous research papers that every paper builds on. And that's an essential aspect of your literature survey. And then there are data characteristics, what I like to call data characteristics. Usually there's some aspect of data, not always, but usually there's some aspect of data inside a research paper. How was the data collected? What was the data that was collected? Right. What, is the, what does it look like? Is it spatial? Is it not spatial? Does it have time? Is, is time relevant here? Right. What, how big is the data? Is it, what is the resolution of the data? Right. Is it structured or unstructured? And so on. Is it, what, what are the data types involved? Is it multivariate? So these are the four essential aspects to extract from every research paper. But now you're no longer obsessing about the how. Just, just a short, short little summary of how is, is fine for your purposes. And so when you're doing your literature survey, you can actually apply something like a template to each paper. And you're trying to write a summary of that paper, right? a one paragraph summary for your literature survey. And so you think, okay, here are these 10 or 20 pages. How do I write a one paragraph summary that extracts the essential information? How is that possible? And this is, this is, a, this is the strategy. Right? This is the information extraction template. This is how you can do it. So you have a, a title, a paper title. You have a concept, one or two sentences. You have an implementation, which is also just one or two sentences. You have a related work, again, maybe two sentences. The most important related work, by the way, not all of the related work, because the related work is usually long. You're trying to identify one or two papers. And then you might talk about data characteristics and analysis techniques. These are kind of optional. Maybe an application domain or maybe some other information like a sample image, your favorite image. 
And that's how you can summarize a research paper in a systematic way and navigate through these thousands of previously published papers. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, my psychic powers are sending me signals. I think somebody's thinking, okay, can we see some examples like of this in action? Am I right? Is somebody thinking that? Yes, of course. Of course, we're going to show some examples. As soon as I have some more. Interesting, isn't it? Is this shocking everybody? I get a feeling that I'm shocking the audience today. Has anybody tried to read a research paper yet? Were you a little bit overwhelmed? And you had no idea there could be a strategy for this, could you? Did you? Of actually reading a research paper and trying to extract the essentials. <clears throat> I wish somebody had taught me this <laughs> when I was a PhD student. So, because I'm a computer scientist, don't worry, there's one example from each field. Uh, we have examples from, from physics, mathematics, bioscience, and geography, and mathematics, and computer science. But because I'm a computer science, the first example is a computer science paper. This is a long and complicated paper, right? It's full of details, and it's complicated and everything. But if I am a PhD student, and I'm trying to figure out what the solved and unsolved problems are, and I need to summarize this paper for a literature survey, this is the essential information that I would extract from that paper. Mm -hmm. Right, the title, a fast and resolution independent line interval convolution algorithm, very, very fancy title. So, but the concept is surprisingly simple and it's one that everybody in this room can understand actually. It's a faster version of the original line interval convolution algorithm. So you might not know what that is, but that's what the concept is. It's a faster version of a previously published paper. So there's, it does computation, but it does it much faster than the previous version. That's the concept. Pretty simple, actually. The concept is actually simple. It's like we've taken some process, and we've made it much faster. That's the concept. So that's a problem that you might not want to solve because it's, a, it's, it's already solved, right? There's a two sentence description of the implementation. If you read the paper, the implementation section is, is like eight pages long. Right? It's full of details. This is just they, they've identified redundant computations and they've reduced the number of redundant computations. Right? And they've also used some improved streamline integrator. That doesn't matter for you guys. That's for computer scientists. And it's not even for all computer scientists. This would just be relevant if you were doing visualization in computer science. The related work is built really, it focuses on one previous paper. The related work section is like a page. It mentions all these related papers, but really there's only one that's the most important. And it's the previous version of the algorithm that it's accelerated. I wrote down some data characteristics here, like the data is 2D, it's time independent, right? It's static. The data resolution is uniform. It's structured. Right? And it's vector field data. So, you know, those are some things that would be important for our computers, might be important for our computer science literature review. Here's a picture, a nice image that helps me remember. I can remember what was happening in this paper. Now, now I can remember this paper pretty easily. Or, Actually, the good news is I can forget this paper very easily. That's, that's good. I can now forget it, 
but it's in my it's in my I've got my one paragraph summary that I can refer to if I need to remember. Remember it. You could <clears throat> now that's a generic template that you can start with, but you can collect in a systematic way other characteristics of research papers and you can customize the template for your purposes. You might not have any data and you might replace the data with something else that's more relevant to what you are working on. Right? This is a very generic process that spans all of science but you can then customize it further if you want to make it more specific to your field. Right? It's not a comprehensive list of characteristics, but it is a systematic approach. It's like you're, you're, you're taking this simplified approach and you're applying it systematically, repeatedly, the same thing over and over again, like a cookie cutter, it's like a cookie cutter process. And it's nice to have a systematic approach to your literature search. Some other characteristics could be summarized, like analysis techniques. What are analysis, what analysis te techniques are used? Like some people use statistics, some people use visualization, some people use software tools. You know, is this, is this research applied to something special? Right? Is it applied to physics or earth sciences or astronomy or chemistry or biology? Maybe you are, that research is applied to some special, in some special context or to some special application. Here's another example from, from computer science. I just chose these two examples because they're very well-known papers. So all the examples are from very famous papers in their respective fields. Right? They're in the top top cited papers of all time. The title of this one is a high resolution 3D surface construction algorithm. And the concept, it, it describes a novel algorithm for construction of isosurfaces. So th that's not going to mean much for anybody in this audience, is it? Does anybody know what an isosurface is? You'll see them when you're during your PhD probably. You'll see ISO contours and ISO surfaces. But th that's the most important thing. It's a one sentence summary of the concept an algorithm for constructing ISO surfaces. And you can get that just by reading. Does anybody know where you find that information? Anybody want to take a guess where you find the concept? Abstract. In the abstract, exactly. You can find it twice. Can you find it anywhere else besides the abstract? In the introduction. Yep. So you get the concept right in the abstract in the introduction. Which is good news, isn't it? That's good news. In computer science, it's section two that's usually the related work section. And then section three, that's the implementation. Here's the implementation. They describe it in the paper. There are six steps. I've just taken the six steps that span six pages, and I've summarized them in, in, in six phrases, essentially. There are, in this one, this example, there are actually two previous papers that are very relevant, the most relevant. And you have to read the related work section, hopefully there is one to extract the two most important previous um, related work. I wrote, took a, a note of the, of the data characteristics, so this is three-dimensional data. It's steady again, that means it's, it's a snapshot, it doesn't change over time. The resolution of the data is 128 cubed or 256 cubed, it's on a regular grid, and it's scalar data. The analysis techniques that are used are volume visualization and isosurface rendering. 
And the application is medical data. So this is really applied to medicine. It's just to help people that are studying medicine, actually, because that's a, that's a person's um, skull or something like that. Any questions so far? How many physicists do we have here? Okay, three. So we have an example from physics. Anybody seen this, this paper before? This is the top cited uh, physics paper of all time. <laughs> this one. So I thought this would be a good idea from physics. This is not the standard, this is not a standard physics paper, I would say. This is a very special physics paper. But we can still apply the same template approach to it, and it still works. It's still fine. This is a literature survey paper on particle physics. It basically can be used as a reference manual for all particle physics. Anybody here doing particle physics? You definitely want to know about this, <laughs> this paper then. <laughs> so how did they get this? How did they do it? So this is what it is, and this is a one-sentence or two-sentence summary of how they did it. How did they construct the survey? They collected data from previous research papers and previous editions of the survey. It's not the first edition of the survey. So it, it looks at another 2,600 measurements from 644 papers. That's a lot. Those guys are working hard. And they list, evaluate, and average the measured properties of, of different subatomic particles. Right? And they're all summarized in tables. You might have noticed there are 130 authors on this this one, so it's a big team. It's like bigger than the physics department. The whole thing. And there is very specific related work, not very difficult, but there's a previous version of this survey that's published like five years or ten years earlier. So it's very clearly a descendant of its parent. Very clear. The data characteristics in this case are measurements, so measurements from experiments and simulation probably, right? And there are over 30,000 of those, all measurements. The analysis technique in this case is just a very extensive literature search. They don't, I didn't see any mention of how they systematically went through the literature. Maybe they didn't do it so systematically. And this is really a reference document for anybody doing particle physics. So you definitely want to check that out. <laughs> and I, they have a URL. I thought, oh, that's an interesting, that you can't see that here because PowerPoint has done some weird things with the color. But it's a, a kind of unusual that a paper has a special URL and says, look, visit this URL to get more information. So. Uh, I just thought, oh, that's special. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a note of that. Other information. I, I can go to this URL for all the tables, reviews, and, and so on. Fifteen hundred pages. <laughs> Let's just see. So, but the good news is, I've just shown you how to write a summary of the essential information you need to extract from this paper. Rather than trying, you would not be able to read 1,500 papers, uh, 1,500 pages, impossible. But it's not necessary either. It's like magic, isn't it? You might be thinking, this is too good to be true. It's, it's, it's almost too good to be true, almost, but it's not. Actually, this is, this is what we're, this is what we do all the time. We do this all the time. Mathematics. Nobody here is from mathematics, so we're gonna we're gonna. Uh, there's a copy of these slides on Blackboard. 
We're gonna we're gonna go to the bioscience example for the bioscientists in the in the audience. Anybody heard of this paper before? This is very old. Look, 1951. But I just chose this one because it's the most cited paper in all of bioscience. It's, the, it's in the world. Like it's the most famous bioscience paper. So I just thought, okay, let's let's include this one as an example. So the concept is procedures are described for the detection and measurement of protein using the folin phenyl reagent. That's the experiment. They're just trying to detect this folin phenyl reagent. Now, I'm not a bioscientist, so isn't that nice that I can take this same template and apply it across the disciplines and still get useful summaries of the papers? So that was an interesting exercise for me. Right, I'm coming from the computer science background. So I thought, this is going to be really interesting for me to pick up my own rules and apply them to like bioscience, physics, geography, and so on, and see if it still works. Right. Sometimes even very small amounts of protein are discovered. So that's a, a summary of the concept. And then they, they have an implementation, obviously, which is lots and lots of different experimental conditions and experiments to discover this, this reagent. So conditions under which the folium phenol reagent could be used to detect protein are varied with respect to acidity, right, pH, reaction time, concentration of reactants, and substances that may interfere with detection. So I've taken that most of the paper, like all of the science papers, is implementation, implementation, extensive description of the experiments used to get to achieve this concept. Right? We just boiled it down, pun intended, to one sentence or two sentences. Now, the, for the related work, this is annoying. There's no related work section. I, you know, it's nice when a a research paper has a related work section. Has anybody come across papers that don't have one? Yeah, so this one doesn't have one. So that makes it more difficult to find out the, more, the, the most important previous predecessor. So I had to do some extra work to figure out what the most important previous papers are from that one. I had to do some extra searching because they were scattered in different places around. I wrote down the data characteristics, like all these different substances they used in their experiments, right? all these different reagents that they used to, to carry out their experiments. For their analysis techniques, I just cropped out a sample figure. They like to do lots of lots of plots, right, two axes, or this one actually has three axes. So there are lots of plots like this that shows the amount of re reactant under different conditions. And this one's time, this, this axis is time in seconds, how long it takes you to get to your, your result. Right, so this curve is persistence of reactivity and so on. So that's the, a sample of their analysis. And the, the application domain is biochemical purposes. They don't say exactly what it's used for. They just give a very general description. Geography. OK. Geography. What are the other examples that we have? Here? Since we're running out of time. Since I don't see geography here, we'll, we'll keep going in the interest of keeping with the schedule. This is just for fun. So this is the template being used to conduct or write a literature survey, actually. So this is one page from a student's literature survey, and they have the template Right? It's hard to see. And then they have 
the next paper, and then the next paper, and then the next paper. They're just applying the template over and over again for each paper, right, for their literature survey. That's an intermediate step, right, in that you group the related papers together in different sections, but that's an intermediate step before you get to your finished and complete literature survey. I just thought it would be fun for you guys to see an intermediate step. The quality is very bad of the projector, but you can download these slides from, from Blackboard and get the high resolution version. And that's me making comments like, you know, change this word, make this, make this better, and so on. And then, just to wrap it up, a comment about breadth versus depth, because this is really, really important. It, I didn't mention it yet, but it's, it's really important. And it's, yeah, I'll stop saying how important it is and just say <laughs> what it says. Your focus now is, de is, is breadth. So you're trying to get an overview of some topic, and that's breadth, before you go too deep into one specific direction. So the depth phase of your studies follows the breadth phase. Right? More time is spent on reading and understanding individual papers in the depth phase, not the breadth phase. So when you've done your literature review and you say, oh, I think I have an overview of the solved problems and now I want to find an unsolved problem, you might pick up one paper and then look at it in more detail. You might do that. Just to make sure that you're not repeating something that somebody else did or maybe you have to recreate the results from somebody else's experiment only when you need to recreate the results of somebody else's experiment do you need to go back and actually read something and understand the how, the implementation in more detail. Does that make sense? That's the depth, the depth phase. Some other things that you, nobody's going to tell you. Not only is understanding all the complexity in every paper unnecessary, but sometimes all the details are missing. Some details are missing. So there are page limits to research papers. So sometimes things get left out that are very important in the implementation because there's not enough space to include them. So that can happen. And also, if you do have to, if you're looking at a paper and you can't understand something because maybe something's not explained very well, or there's some details that are left out, you can contact the authors with questions. You can write them an email or give them a call, and they will be very happy to hear from you. You don't have to just sit, like, in the corner, crying or whatever. <laughs> You can contact the people. That's why the names of the authors are there, and their affiliations are there, and their email addresses are on there, so you can contact them. Otherwise, that information wouldn't be necessary or wouldn't be relevant. So go ahead, and if you're wondering about something, just go, go and write to the authors. I used to do it all the time. I still do it, but as a PhD student, I did it more often. Now I just tell other people to do it. <laughs> and the, another note to th consider, good research, finding a good research direction or an unsolved problem is not really possible based on looking at one paper. You, it's, you can't really just pick up one paper and say, okay, now I have an unsolved problem and I'm going to work on that. You need to look at collection of papers to get an overview of the solved and unsolved problems. So, check for existing surveys on your topic. We just discovered a physics survey in this, in this seminar. But before you work on any surveys, 
look for existing surveys, literature surveys, see what the existing literature surveys say. So just a little summary. So navigating the jungle of previously published literature is very, very difficult. It's, it's kind of always going to be difficult. It's something that everybody, every scientist struggles with always, so it doesn't stop. And gathering the most important information from hundreds or thousands of previous, previously published papers is very difficult. And this is a, a process that can help you address that challenge, a systematic process. And it can be used to write your survey, your literature survey, that you'll all have at the end of your first year, a beautiful literature survey. Any questions? These are the exact references for the papers that we summarized in the in the lecture, so if you actually want to download the papers, I put a copy of them on Blackboard as well. So if you want to like, see what the papers look like and then see what my summaries look like as a, as a, to, as a comparison, you can download the original, original papers. And just one other note, if you're curious, the one previously published paper on this topic is here. You can down, you can Google that title and actually download the paper like, that describes this process. The, there is a, a caveat though. This is a visualization research paper. This is not physics and bioscience and geography and so on. It's for computer scientists, but it would still it this lecture is a generalization of that specific specific instance or that specific direction. So if you're curious about seeing it in a written form in more detail, you can download that PDF. Everything is available on Blackboard. And on like Google knows where it is too. Exciting stuff. A big difference from the first seminar, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, you're all free. If you have more questions. Now learn and better use the pen. Rip the praises high. How the rap on cheap from Ireland Greek is still from wheat and rye. Be away with your pills and the cure ills. Be a pagan Christian Jew. Take off your coat and greet your friends.